Hey everyone, welcome back to Add to Your Faith Ministry Synoptic Gospel Study. I'm Elizabeth Lenny Bardhan, and today we're going to be continuing in our study of Matthew chapter 22 with parallel passages in Luke and Mark about paying taxes to Caesar and see what Jesus had to say about that. So looking at Mark chapter 22, starting in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. I'll jump over to Mark um, chapter 12, looking at verses 13 to 17. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. And let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then finally in Luke chapter 20, verses 20 to 26, let's look at those. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told his parable against them, and they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for uh, for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius, whose likeness inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able, in the presence of the people, to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. Now, from these three passages, I think we have a very full view of what happened. Um, First of all, the Pharisees and the Herodians join together to stand against Christ. Now I have a good uh, reference from gotquestions.com that explains the Herodians were a non-religious Jewish party who supported the dynasty of Herod and the general policy of the Roman government. They perceived that Christ's pure and spiritual teaching and influence were antagonistic to their interest. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were members of an ancient Jewish sect who believed in the strict observance of oral traditions and the written law of Moses. They didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah, despite his many miracles during his earthly ministry. Although Herodians and Pharisees were at opposite ends of the political spectrum, their common hatred of Christ was enough for them to join forces to try to destroy him. Okay, so you have the Herodians, um, non-religious, pro-Herod Jews, and you have the Pharisees, extremely religious, anti-Jesus Jews, coming together to try to trap Jesus in a political argument that would make him able to be arrested um, and given over to the governing authorities who had jurisdiction. So the reason they um, brought up the questions that they did were because um, the Jewish people did not like having to pay tax to Rome. Um, From uh, BibleRef.com, it explains the, the summary of the context and it says um, Matthew 22 15 22 is a famous event containing Jesus' response to the issue of taxes. The moment is also depicted in Mark and in Luke. In that context Jewish people resented being forced to pay those taxes to Rome. This makes the challenge a trap. The Pharisees want Jesus to make an unpopular statement or open himself to arrest for rebellion against the Roman Empire. Instead, Jesus points out that the Roman denarius has Caesar's image on it. He then tells people to give Caesar what is his and give God what is God's. 
which subtly implies that we should give ourselves to God since we bear his image. Okay, so just kind of an overview summary there. So let's look at some of the particular things that happen. So one is these um, Herodians and Pharisees had spies, is what Mark explains, that pretended to be followers of, Greece, uh, of Jesus. They, in, they pretended that they were faithful followers. Let's look at that point in Mark. Sorry, that's in Luke. Luke chapter 20, verses um, 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said. So it's significant that they were pretending to be sincere followers of Christ um, in order to make him feel you know, at ease around them, hoping he would trust them with an opinion that they then could turn him over to Rome um, as a criminal. So Jesus calls them hypocrites. Um, he recognizes, uh, Matthew calls it their malice and calls them hypocrites. Um, in uh, Luke, he refers to them as crafty. So hypocrites and craftiness and malice, these words that are used by Christ to describe um, these spies, why, why significantly did he pick those words? So first of all, calling them hypocrites, um, it's a little bit different than the way we use the word today. Hypocrisy from a Greek perspective was acting. Um, the hypocrites were the actors who would act out the Greek plays. They usually would have masks to play different parts. Women did not act, so men would have a mask, a female mask, that they would wear when they were playing the female part, and then they could take that off and have a different mask for different parts. So that's the way the Greek plays were done. So they were called hypocrites because they had many faces. Jesus calls these spies hypocrites because they were acting like they were his followers while actually were trying to um, catch him doing something illegal. So in that way, they were crafty and, as it says, full of malice. That idea of being full of malice is it's from the Greek word poneros, which means wickedness or evil, full of wickedness or evil. So they were pretending to be believers, they were pretending to be sincere followers, but they were full of wickedness and evil and craftiness as they had this cunning plot to try to um, catch Jesus in something. Now obviously because Jesus is God, he could not be caught doing something illegal. He could did not sin, could not sin, so he would not be breaking the law or doing something illegal. But also he was too aware of the culture he was in to say anything that would um, cause an offense with the people that were genuinely following. Um, so since the Jewish people had such an issue with taxation, uh, also they had an issue with the coins themselves because the coins had the face of Caesar on them. And because the second commandment says to not have any graven images, they were very offended at being forced to use that kind of coin that had Caesar's image engraved upon it. Um, and so there was also the chance that if Jesus said, you should definitely use that coin and do that, then they, he could be also committing a cultural offense. Um, so Jesus being Jesus, being a very aware of the culture, very aware of the law, and aware of the people he was speaking to, um, asked this fabulous question for to see a coin. And he asked them, whose image is that? And they say, it's Caesar's. He says, well, then give to Caesar's what's Caesar's, and give to God what's God's. So what was the lesson that Jesus was teaching in that moment? Uh, I think it's very, very beautiful that Jesus turned this question of image, because the image on the coin, to the image of God. Give the things that are Caesar's, Caesar's. Give the things that are God's to God. What is bearing the image of God? We are. Humans are image bearers of God. We are made in his image. Just as those coins were made in the image of Caesar, so we are in the image of God. And so Jesus is taking this whole attack as they're coming against him and changing it to a truth about image and about the two kingdoms. The earthly kingdom at that time belonged to Caesar. Heavenly kingdom is God's. We are in both kingdoms as humans in the sense that we have to live in this world. We have to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. 
But we also need to be in the kingdom of God and give to God the things that are God's. Jesus is really distinguishing between spiritual and secular. In that way, they couldn't attack him because he neither um, uplifted the Roman Empire in a way that would offend Jews, nor did he belittle the Roman Empire in a way that would be against the law. And so they marveled at him. They were amazed because his answer was so wise, there was no way for him to fall into their trap in either direction of going one way that was offensive or the other way that was illegal. Jesus, of course, is all wisdom, and humans can never trap God, but it's just so interesting how um, Jesus taught us to respect our governments, to be submitted to the kingdoms that we're in, while also being giving to God who we are. That's so much more important than worrying about money. Your taxes are just taxes, right? They're just money. That's an earthly thing. And we're not supposed to um, be so concerned with the things of this world that we are trapped in this kind of bitterness or resentment towards the governments that we are in. As Jesus taught, life is more than raiment. Um, like, it's, it's not just about having money, being able to buy the things that you want, being able to make more money, and so being angry when you have to give some of that money to the government. Instead, it's recognizing that the things of this world are of this world, and we just need to work with the systems we're in without bitterness or resentment or anger, while recognizing that we should be giving ourselves to God, because we are His image bearers. Um, and so in that way, Jesus also, in saying, why do you put me to the test? Because there is... Um, the clear direction in the Old, Old Testament, do not put God to test. We're not supposed to test God in that way, like to try to catch him something. And Jesus used that um, when Satan was tempting him in the uh, desert. Uh, Jesus said, why, why do you put God to the test? Uh, we're not supposed to put God to the test. When he tried to get him to throw himself down and the angels to catch him, Jesus said that would be a way of testing God. And in this, they're trying to trick God, catch him in something, um, trying to get by with something. He's like, why do you test me? And in that way, it's subtly identifying himself as God. And by saying, give to Caesar with Caesar's, let the things of this earth be what they are, give to God the things that are God, they should be recognizing Jesus as Messiah and giving themselves to worship him and to following him. Um, <clears throat> so he said a lot um, that is of spiritual significance while not um, saying anything that would get him into trouble. So it's, it's so well done. Obviously, we always respect everything Jesus says, but just seeing that in this moment he responded with a earthly wisdom, like the way he um, reasoned with them in a in a pure and beautiful way is something we can all learn from in handling difficult situations to look for God's discretion. Now, for a lot of people, this passage is complicated because of whatever government they're living under, not wanting to submit to government authority, not wanting to follow their governments, wanting to overthrow or rebel against a structure, that this becomes such a big question. So where does that lie? So um, some of you watching may be in America, which is much more famous for being rebellious against um, authority. That's how America was founded, was by overthrowing the British authority over taxes because the British government was taxing the people very strongly or harshly and the American people who were then British uh, rejected that idea and that's why you had the Boston Tea Party they threw over all the tea because that's what was being taxed and you know there's just a lot of history in America of rebelling against taxation and in other countries um, there's different political issues that come up as um, for Christians to ask, is this something that we need to submit to, or is this something that we can stand against? And um, I think it's a very important question for anyone who struggles with submitting to authority or accepting government rule to see how Jesus points out that government is just government. Con you know, like, earthly culture is just earthly culture. And the kingdom of heaven, giving ourselves to God, is much more important than struggling, as the Jews were doing, against things like taxation. 
Just give them what you're supposed to give them and give yourself to God. And I really see in that, like, stop fighting the earthly system and just do what's expected while submitting yourself fully to God. And so some, some of you may argue that, you know, we have the right to stand against um, certain governments, especially in America. Again, you do have a right to have a voice as a democratic country, like here in Korea, it's a democratic country. You do have the right to vote and to express your feelings because it's supposed to be a, a population driven government. And this is the people are supposed to have a voice in the government structure. That's how the government is structured to avoid a tyrannical government. So in that you actually are have been given the authority by the way the authority was structured to have a voice and to be able to use that voice well. And I think it's very important if you're in a country that allows you to vote and allows you to have a voice in how people are treated and how everything is structured to use that well and to use that wisely. But I don't think we should become obsessed with the political systems in place and with the government method that we lose sight of a kingdom mindset that what God wants us to do is live in this world, but not be of it. We don't need to be so obsessed with what's happening in government, happening in um, the culture around us, so that we lose our focus on the kingdom. However, we do live in the world, and God does want us very passionately to stand against injustice, to stand against oppression, um, to stand for those who are being oppressed. You know, that's why the scriptures say, to stand for the foreigners in your midst, to stand for orphans and widows. It goes through all these passages that are very important. For example, if you look at Isaiah chapter 10, um, it says, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression, to turn aside the needy from justice, and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the ruin that will come from afar? God does not ever like powerful people oppressing those who have no voice. Always wants Christians to stand with widows, those who don't have the um, protection of a husband, with orphans, those who don't have the protection of a father, um, with foreigners, those who don't belong within the culture, with anyone that has that experiences oppression and has no voice or power of their own to stand against that, Christians are called throughout scripture to stand up and defend those who need to be defended so that people in power cannot oppress them. That's very clear all throughout scripture. So in saying that we are not to be of this world, it doesn't mean that we ignore injustice, that we ignore oppression, that we allow iniquitous decrees. That means laws that are written uh, out of self-will that is evil rather than for good. Um, and for, to stop the writers who are writing oppression. Again, the idea of laws that are being written that oppress others. We are, as the people of God, supposed to stand against anything like that. Um, that is extremely important. And later in Isaiah, um, when he, God is talking about fasting and the reason for fasting so that we can give our food to the hungry, um, that we can focus on our spiritual life rather than our earthly life, it also says that isn't this the fast that I've chosen to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke. Isn't it to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your home, to clothe the naked when you see him, and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will come quickly. Um, there is a continuing pattern throughout Scripture that as Christians, we're the ones who are supposed to be standing up for those who need help. The like I said, the oppressed, the, the homeless, the poor, the naked, those who have need, those who have um, any kind of struggle, we are not just supposed to say, oh, the government will take care of that, or somebody else will take care of that. We, as the people of God, are supposed to, when we see those things, make a difference in the lives of those people, and not just allow a continuation of any kind of oppression or um, hunger or need just to be going on without our... Um, stepping up to to help and I think it's just within this idea of you know give to Caesars what Caesars and the God was God's um, 
while recognizing that the government structure that's there is something we're supposed to submit to, while standing against the laws and the decrees that cause oppression and that hurt people and doing everything within our power to help those who are being oppressed, to help those who have need, that all of that is um, the way we live the kingdom mindset. That's how we give unto God the things that are God's. As God's image bearers, we do unto him what he wants done um, rather than being like the Jewish people in this point who are just focused on, I don't want to pay the taxes, um, instead saying, give him what you need to give him, and then you do for God what you need to do for God. And that's why in Matthew 25, when Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to drink, I was thirsty, um, or you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger and you took me in. Those actions are the things God wants us to be doing for people. He wants us to be... Um, Having a kingdom mindset so that whatever food we have, we can have self-control to eat less so that we have more to give. Whatever money we have, we can have the um, generosity to share with those who have need. Whatever power we have in our governments, in our families, in our areas, using that to help those who are struggling under oppression or under mistreatment. Um, in Luke... Um, John was teaching and he said whoever has two tunics should share with him who has none whoever has food should do the same um, if you have more clothes than you need sharing that with people who don't have what they need the the idea that you see so much in Jesus's clear division between the secular world and the spiritual world is that as Christians we need to live on this world in a way that is generous and that is selfless while being diligent to protect those who need protected and to deliver those who need delivered and um, I'm passionate about this right now because this is the focus of my in-person women's Bible study as we're studying um, the title of it is real or show you real or worthless uh, the study of daily authentic religious practice um, so this is what we're we're going through right now um, and so it's kind of in my face as I teach it but just being aware that God does not want us to worry about things like taxes and government rule but instead wants us to be focused on how can I give unto God the things that are God's what is like my money that's going to Caesar, okay, fine, I pay my taxes, I do what I'm expected to do. Now with the money that's left, am I generous in helping others? And how can I be helpful and generous to others in other ways, not just money, you know, like, like food and clothes and, and time and energy? And am I using my energy in government aspects to demand my rights or to demand the rights of those who need help? Like it's... It's just important that as Christians, we do not lose the perspective of what it means to live in the kingdom mindset and to give unto God the things that are God's. Um, and especially when it comes in a comparison to the things of this world, the governments and rulers, that just to be careful what we argue for and argue against. If you find that the people you're listening to are full of conspiracies and anger and bitterness about how the government is run or who's in ruling a party and this group's doing this and that group's doing that and this um, party is doing this and this party is doing that then you can get trapped in a worldly mindset of bitterness and anger and frustration at how government is ruled if you remember that you are not of this world that you're of the kingdom of God that you have much more important things to be doing like actually helping those who are oppressed rather than complaining that the government is not or making a difference in the lives of the hungry rather than complaining that you have to pay taxes then your mindset and your lifestyle will be reflected of the love of Jesus Christ rather than a person who's full of conspiracies and anger and fear and bitterness if people read your Facebook page if people look at your social media if they listen to what you have to say around a dinner table are your conversations and your ideas reflecting a love for Christ and an energy and a passion for the thing that God is passionate about? Or is it full of uh, a negativity and a, a brokenness about the wrong thing? 
Um, are you so patriotically driven that all you can talk about is how the government needs to change? Or are you so biblically and kingdom driven that what you're talking about is how Jesus can work through you to make a difference? One is passively angry. Like, I hate that the government's doing this. I can't believe this leader is this way. How horrible that they blah, blah, blah. Or, what can I do about the hungry? What can I do about the poor? What can I do about the weak? And in that, instead of having displaced passion that is focused on the wrong thing, you are giving to the government what you need to. You are working within the system while serving the kingdom of God, giving unto God the things that are God's. Your soul who you are, that imprint of God, that image of God that you are, is being given to God in full surrender and obedience to live the way he wants you to live, which is very strong in humility and in meekness, your anger under control, and your passion focused on the things that God is passionate about. And in that, if your focus is so much, how can I help orphans? How can I help widows? How can I help oppressed? How can I be a voice for those who are voiceless? Then you're not going to have time to be passionate about political things that truly just need to stay in the political realm and for those that are of this world rather than of the kingdom of Christ. When you become a Christian and you accept the blood offering of Jesus Christ to pay for your sins, in that contract, you are accepting that this world is no longer your home, that you are being made a part of God's kingdom. And in that, you have to let go of any earthly ties that tie you down to a mentality of of, of patriotism to a point of forgetting your kingdom mind. I, I know several Christians um, who are very much faithful in their belief and yet their life is not marked with humility or sacrifice but instead is marked with this overt passion and patriotism to where everything is about their country and everything is about um, how great their country is and how fantastic um, their history is and how powerful they are and how everyone else should be afraid and just this, this uh, rhetoric of patriotism that is how they see the world and in that it's as if it makes them not see the kingdom now they may see the kingdom but their outward declaration what they focus on with their words in their life is so loud you can't see the kingdom side and I don't want that to be true of, of our lives we need to choose a walk with Christ that is before everything else and following Christ and serving him being more important than any following or serving of any government while correctly submitting to the authority and doing the things that are expected of us and that is a balance that I think we all have to carefully walk so as to not be trapped in the wrong mentality. So Jesus, they tried to trap him. They tried to catch him saying something he shouldn't either for the government or against it. And instead he spoke with the wisdom of the kingdom. And I hope that all of us can have that same discretion and wisdom to not be trapped to speak for or against in any way the things of this world, but instead to speak with passion and authority about the love of Christ while living that out to the people around us so that our religion is truly real and not worthless. Uh, I hope that um, you are encouraged and strengthened today, and I look forward to any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Bye-bye.